감사합니다. 그 함재봉입니다. 양해해 주시면 영어로 어, 말씀드리겠습니다. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, friends, colleagues uh, from all over the world. Uh, sorry to ruin your morning with this very uh, <laughs> somber video. Uh, but basically, uh, it, that's the question that we wanted to raise uh, with you and, and hope that we can engage over the next two days. Uh, maybe we outdid ourselves in this one. Uh, but I think the sense of uh, uh, gloom, uh, futility, hopelessness, wh whether it comes to economic issues, whether it comes to security issues, I think it's, it's very, very prevalent uh, everywhere um, in the world today. And so uh, I sincerely hope that uh, we, you carry the image of this uh, video uh, throughout the next two days and really help us uh, answer the question, is this the new normal? Is this, is this acceptable? Or if it's not, or it sh whether it, if it shouldn't be the normal, uh, what is that we can do? And where do you think the new vision and where, where the new leadership uh, will be coming from? So uh, my short welcome uh, to you. And then I turn to my uh, most enjoyable task. Uh, every year that we do the plenum, uh, I, I have this pleasure, pleasure and, and honor of introducing uh, my boss, the, the founding chairman of the, of the ASAN Institute, uh, who really does not need an introduction. Uh, for, for those of you uh, who need a little bit of it, uh, I'll give you some of, of his achievements. He was a seven-term National Assemblyman. Uh, he, was, he is the, currently the chairman uh, of the board of the largest philanthropic organization in Korea, the ASAN uh, Foundation. Uh, he's also the founding chairman of a Nanum uh, Foundation, which for those of you who might be interested, this is one of the most original efforts now being undertaken in, in Korea to foster entrepreneurship and to uh, foster startup, uh, especially among the youth uh, in Korea. And uh, MJ is also the, the founder of that, uh, of that um, a foundation. Um, among other things, uh, he brought the World Cup 2002 to, to South Korea. Um, and he also helped his father uh, 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 bring the 1998 uh, 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 Olympics uh, to uh, South Korea as well. So uh, with that very short introduction, I have the great pleasure of introducing to you Dr. MJ Chung. The music video we just saw before is the best music video I've ever seen. <laughs> Jaebong, you did a good job. Thank you. <clears throat> Distinguished guests, friends, good morning. We gather at a critical time for Korea and the world. Since the beginning of this year, North Korea has conducted first nuclear test and the launch of ICBM. Two days ago, North Korea tested SLBM, submarine launched ballistic missile. As one expert said, North Korea's SLBM capability has gone from a joke to something very serious. Many people predict its fifth nuclear test soon. T.S. Eliot once said, humankind cannot bear very much reality, but this does not absolve our responsibility to face the reality. 
given the ever increasing threat from North Korea, it is unnerving to hear some national security debates coming from the U.S. Some accuse South Korea of free riding on the U.S. I am afraid such statements reflect a recurring isolationist strain in the U.S. On the face of it, it may seem unfair that the U.S. is paying for another country's defense. This is a superficial understanding of the reality. The ROK-US alliance was forged during the Korean War. The Korean War was not simply a war between the two Koreas. It was not a civil war, as some say. In 1949, China became communist. In January 1950, U.S. Secretary of State Dean Acheson left South Korea out of U.S. defense perimeter in the Asia Pacific. In June 1950, same year, North Korea launched the invasion supported by the Soviet Union and China. The U.S. quickly responding, responded by sending troops even before the U.N. Security Council resolution. However, the primary reason we understand, the reason for the quick U.S. response was to prevent Japan from being communized. The Korean War was a war between the great powers, the U.S., the Soviet Union, and China. It was a flashpoint in the global Cold War that was just beginning to emerge. The Korean people were the victims of a big power rivalry. At the height of the Korean War, I was uh, born in Busan, the only city left in the hands of a free democracy. If it had not been for the U.S., I would not be here today. South Korea's prosperity has been built upon the security provided by the alliance. For this, we Koreans are very grateful. South Korea is also proud to have played its part we have made our share of sacrifices in sustaining this alliance. We are not free riders. The ROK-US alliance is the anchor for peace and stability in this region. May I change the subject at this moment? <laughs> Six years ago, when I met then Prime Minister Putin in Moscow, we discussed how to sell Siberia gas to South Korea. Prime Minister Putin told me about a plan to build gas liquefying plant in Vladivostok and then shipping the LNG to South Korea. I suggested it would be better if Russia could build a gas pipeline through North Korea all the way to South Korea. Prime Minister Putin wondered whether we could trust North Korea. I told him to lower the operational risk. Russia could send half of the gas through the pipeline and the rest could be shipped. A project like this would have a transformative effect on the security situation in Northeast Asia. My parents came from North Korea. In 1989, my father visited his hometown in North Korea. It was his first homecoming in 60 years, since running away from his home when he was 16. When he woke up in the middle of the night during his stay in his hometown, his cousin pulled a blanket over, over both of them and whispered into my father's ear. Please don't try to help. Don't ask anything. Just go back as soon as you can. I know that my father's spirit is with us here today. He would have been very grateful 
for, your, for all your concerns about North Korea. I thank you on his behalf. Distinguished guests and friends, they say it is darkest right before dawn. We have come a long way. The Republic of Korea has emerged as a prosperous and democratic nation. It is my sincere hope the gathering of great minds here today will provide us with the wisdom to sustain peace and prosperity in this part of the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Chung. Uh, now I have the uh, great pleasure and honor of introducing to you the, the keynote speaker uh, for Asan Plenum 2016. Um, uh, he also doesn't need an introduction. Uh, Dr. John Hamry uh, has been the uh, Under Secretary of Defense. He also served as the 26th uh, uh, Deputy Secretary of Defense. Uh, and currently he's the president and CEO of, of Center for uh, Strategic and International Studies, uh, the premier uh, think tank, uh, policy think tank in Washington, D.C. And uh, I know some of you may have different opinions on this, but <laughs> uh, uh, I'm looking at certain people here. But, uh, uh, but there's clearly no doubt that under uh, Dr. Hamry's leadership, CSIS really has uh, been having a true renaissance, including a beautiful new, new building. Uh, uh, we also have a very close relationship, not just in terms of research uh, and other cooperations, but we also have this program uh, of uh, Asan Young Fellows that we send, and, and CSIS every year uh, has always been gracious to host two, actually two of our, our young fellows and we are very grateful for this uh, partnership. Um, I, I really cannot think of a better person to address the issue at hand here today uh, than Dr. Hamry, and so please join me in welcoming Dr. John Hamry to the podium. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for coming. This is a, an enormously impressive uh, gathering. And first, let me uh, congratulate you, uh, M.J. Chung, uh, for founding the Asan Institute, and Dr. Ham, who is a very, very dynamic leader. I, it's, uh, I must say, uh, I, we do lots of conferences uh, at CSIS, and I know what it takes to put on a world-class conference, and you have done this masterfully. I, I really, it gives me a, a, a blend of emotions. Um, Respect, envy, and considerable fear as a, as a competitor. So <laughs> I want to congratulate you. I think this is a really a splendid conference. Um, you've, uh, you've asked me to give a, a large framing set of remarks about this conference. What is the new normal? Uh, honestly, nothing feels normal right now. It, uh, I feel it's... Uh, everything is off balance. Uh, the leading Republican candidate in our presidential election process is openly questioning whether NATO is still, uh, uh, NATO alliance is of any value and has stated that we should renegotiate unfavorable agreements with our Asian alliance partners, implying that we should withdraw if they don't agree to more generous support of our deployments here. Personally, I think this is absolutely crazy. Um, I'm struggling to find anything these days that feels at all normal. Um, you've given me a, a very large uh, assignment, and that is to provide a framing address for the start of this very impressive conference. We're going to talk about a wide range of issues over the next two days. Uh, and I think since it's such a large question, uh, I, I, I'm going to try to frame a very large canvas, if I may. Uh, this spring, CSIS, we did a, uh, uh, we concluded a very large effort which we call the History Project. 
Uh, last year, uh, we established something called the Brzezinski Institute, uh, named after Dr. Zbigniew Brzezinski, which was dedicated to undertaking a systematic analysis of strategic issues through the perspective of geography and history. Very, very important uh, initiative for us. The project, the first project that we undertook was to ascertain the meaning of this question, what is the meaning of the 20th century? Uh, we sought to study the history of the 20th century, not from an American-centric point of view, but by recruiting historians from other countries to help us look at the 20th century and to try to ascertain its meaning. We recruited historians from, uh, from Germany, from Turkey, from India, China, Japan, and the United States. Uh, we, we, we lacked the resources. We should have had a larger uh, list, and we intend to, to continue the project, and we should, have, uh, we should have had more, but we just didn't have the money at port at the time. We told each of these historians to, uh, to reflect on the large developments that had global significance in the 20th century. The collapse of the empires uh, and World War I, the Great Depression, the uh, World War II and the rise of the Cold War, and then ultimately the collapse of the Warsaw Pact. And we asked each of them to reflect on those large events, but from a context of their own national experience. Now, I'm a, I'm a political scientist. I'm not a historian, so I will not do justice to their scholarship. But I would reflect on a few key points as a political scientist. And I ask myself uh, a central question. Uh, why was the first half of the 20th century so, such a disaster. And why was the second half of the 20th century such a remarkable period of progress? Uh, first, we need to reflect on the first half. Um, I believe that there were three large primary forces that shaped the first half of the 20th century. You know, now, the 20th century didn't start promptly at midnight on 1900. I mean, it, it had antecedents. But so let me look at each of these separately. Uh, first, from a period of about uh, 1885 until 1914, we saw an unprecedented collapse of the international system that had dominated the international order for 300 years. The Qin Dynasty was imploding. The Romanovs were in advanced decay. The Habsburg Empire was collapsing. We Americans overthrew the hapless Spanish Empire and took their colonies. Uh, the Ottoman Empire became the sick man of Europe. The British and French empires were increasingly hollow. The vitality of great empires was declining sharply. And World War I effectively crushed the imperial system. That was the first. Factor. The second major factor was the rise during this period of national popular leaders in the colonies of these empires who were challenging the legitimacy of the empires and articulating a narrative of national expression and destiny. In essence, the empires educated the elites who would rise up to break apart the empires. One feature of colonialism was that most of the, the most promising children of elite families were given international educations, brought to metropolitan capitals, given educations, and had a wide-ranging experience. The goal, of course, was to indoctrinate them uh, to make uh, into the grandeur of the empire. But these elites began to develop a shared consciousness of the possibility of their own national expression, their own national independence. The third force, which I think was crucial, and that was during this period, we saw a remarkable transformation caused by new technologies. Most important for this discussion is the development of steam-powered sea transport and the telegraph and under-ocean telegraph cables. These technologies transformed political consciousness of elites. Developments in distant lands reinforced the political imagination of these rising nationalists. Steam-powered, uh, well, for example, Ataturk in Turkey directly was inspired by the, the, uh, 
Japanese defeat of Russia in the, in the Russo-Japanese War in 1904. He took his inspiration from that. Uh, Steam-powered sea transport dramatically lowered the cost of international travel so that someone like Sun Yat-sen could take an education in Hawaii and then travel internationally extensively. Because of the telegraph and because of underwater uh, telegraph cables, uh, newspapers could now publish events that occurred only days, sometimes even hours earlier. So there was a, glow, a growing consciousness, political consciousness. The rising nationalist elites became aware of the decay of the empires and the success of their counterparts. National elites started to develop a political consciousness by becoming aware of these broader developments and these ideas. So the 20th century um, began in the middle of this story of collapse and regeneration. World War I put an exclamation point on these developments. The European empires were still sufficiently strong after World War I to dictate the political outcomes of the war, the post-war order, but those outcomes were hugely disappointing to the rising political elites around the world. The, political, the European foreign policy establishment did not comprehend the underlying changes in the world and fashioned a piece that simply set the stage for further conflict. The Great Depression, which was the second pivotal event of the, of the, of the 20th century, it ripped through the economies around the world. We Americans tend to think about it as our experience. It was a global experience. Uh, the collapse of consumer demand in the United States caused a deep recession in Japan, for example. Young and relatively immature governments around the world were forced to cope with the local impact of the Depression and deal with the forces that extended well beyond their sovereign reach to solve the problems. All of the countries struggled. Some of them made bad decisions, very bad decisions. Fascism took root in Japan and Germany, causing enormous damage and heartache to the world. The Soviet Union coped with it, but only through an astoundingly brutal collectivization process. The forces of fascism and communism took hold and propelled the world into the second great global war in a period of only 20 years. The first half of the 20th century was arguably the worst period in human history. Vast destruction of human life and material progress was unprecedented. For the first time in history, war was global, not local, but global. Hundreds of millions of people died in the first half of the 20th century. It was a horrible time. But the second half of the 20th century was equally remarkable. The second half of the 20th century witnessed the most astounding burst of prosperity and progress of any time in human history. We, um, we human beings defeated and eliminated smallpox. Smallpox was a disease that killed an estimated 300 million people in the 19th century. Engineers invented aircraft that could take us halfway around the world in less than a day. Billions of people who lived on the edge of starvation were brought into comfortable middle-class existence. A decade that started with the telegraph ended with the internet. The second half of the 20th century was just as positive and remarkable as the first half was discouraging and damaging. To what can we attribute this remarkable transition? To my mind, the most important factor was the establishment of international institutions that emerged after World War II and shaped the second half of the 20th century. We Americans working with others created international institutions designed to address problems that transcend the capabilities of any one country meant to manage. Institutions like the United Nations, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, the International Civil Aviation Organization, the World Health Organization, etc. And these institutions were augmented by less formal institutions, such as the G7, the G20, the wealth of regional co in, uh, coordination institutions here in Asia. 
we created a network of institutions designed to create a shared venue where we could work on problems that extended beyond the reach of any one country's capacities. And we grounded these institutions in a liberal international worldview with values such as rule of law, transparency, accountability of governments to citizens, an open and a free press. These values and these institutions profoundly changed the second half of the 20th century and set the norms by which individual nations are now judged by their actions. We are now 16 years into the 21st century, but the second half of the 20th century was the starting point for our day. And here we are at the 2016 Assan Plenum to ask this question, what is the new normal? What is the character of our time? And what can we do to improve the trajectory of human life? Well, permit me to enumerate a few of the larger forces that I see today uh, that give me some concern. First, technology is again transforming our collective consciousness. In the year 1900, the telegraph created global perceptions, but only among a small number of elite leaders. Today, we are living through a time where social media is creating a profound change in political consciousness among vast populations. Dr. Zbigniew Brzezinski talks about this age as a vast awakening of political consciousness, creating conditions that are hard for governments to manage. A good example of this is the uh, so-called Panama Papers that show how elites on a global basis have created pathways for moving their private wealth away from the control of sovereign tax authorities. Second, this revolution in communications technology now creates an enormous challenge for individuals who lead institutions. Those institutions, whether they are governments or corporations or think tanks or universities, they exist within a legal framework of laws, obligations, and constraints that underpin their legitimacy. They also limit their speed of action. Those who have no institutions to defend can quickly move and with very few external constraints on their actions. People who lead institutions are burdened by many cross currents of obligations. Democracies are especially vulnerable at, the, at a time like this. Democracies confront propaganda activities designed to unhinge domestic institutions. But they, can respond, they can't respond until they have established the framework of truth and the range of plausible actions. The propagandists are not held to a standard of truth. They are held to a standard only of efficacy. Authoritarian governments have become far more effective in using social media for propaganda purposes because their messages do not have to be true. They only have to be effective. So those who have to defend large institutions, either government or private sector institutions, have a web of considerations they must navigate before they can act. They are handicapped in this new era. Third, Technology developments of the last 30 years have had a profound impact on every nation. Globe-spanning communications now means that design laboratories can be thousands of miles away from production factories. The revolution of transport with the advent of container shipping and intermodal transfer means that factories in distant lands can relatively quickly supply consumers half a world away. Similarly, Ebola can break out in West Africa, and jet transport can bring the disease to America within days. These new technologies have effectively erased the bureaucratic distinction between national security and homeland security. A war in Syria con and continuing crisis in Afghanistan have brought a domestic crisis to Europe that could break apart the European Union. Yet most of Europe most, yet most democracies have a great divide between their military establishments and their domestic police authorities. This void contributed to the ease with which ISIS terrorists were able to bomb the airport in Brussels, for example. 
these new technologies and globe-spanning business practices are also straining domestic society. Citizens feel threatened by global economic developments and fear that their politicians are not protecting them adequately from these forces. We see considerable anxiety in almost every developed country about the viability of the social compact in each country. That, of course, undergirds and informs Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders. Fourth, the Cold War thankfully ended without catastrophic violence, but the Cold War also left us with a terrible legacy. During this period, we learned how to build nuclear weapons and biological weapons. We have around us vast quantities of dangerous things and the knowledge to adapt them for vile purposes. Computational biology is now creating the capacity for individuals to build horrifying biological pathogens, no longer depending on sophisticated laboratories, but well within the reach of their kitchen sink. The old paradigm of nation states waging war in conventional ways is now distant. But the prospect of destabilizing actions by small groups of people, some with state sponsorship, is very real and holds the prospect for unhinging entire nations. Is this the new normal? What can we do about this? Well, it seems to me the problem comes down to a very simple proposition. All of the genuinely complex problems in the world today are horizontal, and all of the governments are structurally vertical. We collectively share a dangerous new world, and we lack the structures of coordination to manage these problems. There is no uniform and universal solution to this problem. The United Nations is essential, but completely insufficient for the myriad of complex issues we face today. The World Bank and the IMF are essential, but so too are regional financial institutions, such as the Asia Development Bank and the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank. The World Health Organization is essential, but far too weak to manage the crises we face. It needs revision and augmentation. The new normal feels very frightening. If there is one strategy for all of us to deal with this frightening new normal, it is the imperative of rebuilding effective institutions of multilateral coordination and response. At the end of World War II, America committed itself to be a leader of a new international system one grounded on our shared core values of rule of law, accountability of governments to citizens, transparency, and a premium on diplomacy and due process. I continue to think that is the foundation that will carry us through this dangerous new era. Finally, let me just say I find it very disturbing to hear a leading Republican candidate for president talks so disparagingly about allies and international obligations. Building a beautiful wall to separate America from Mexico is precisely the wrong formulation for our problems. This particular candidate has stated that we need to renegotiate our alliance with Korea and Japan, stating that we agreed to terms that were unfair to America. I'm offended by this. Alliances are not simple contracts. Alliances are obligations that we enter into with conviction and national consensus. I believe one of the primary reasons why the second half of the 20th century was so much better is because America did not retreat into isolationism after World War II, but instead took on alliance relationships and partnerships. America's alliance with Korea is the foundation of America's security. America is more safe and secure because Korea is free and prosperous. Allies like Korea have come to underpin the peaceful order that we seek today. Allies like Korea have started off as followers of America's lead, but now Korea has gone on to become an international leader in providing public goods in areas stretching from overseas development assistance to clean energy development to nuclear safety and security. There may be some Americans who think that we don't need our allies, 
But the international order that sustains us today is not possible without allies. America's at a crossroads. Many Americans would like to retreat from being a leader in this dangerous new world. I think that would be a tragic mistake. It is up to all of us to lead a, a wiser, more thoughtful debate, to chart a way toward what is good for everyone in the world. We have to recreate a rational and effective new normal, and it will take working with allies and with competitors to build this more rational and safe new world. Thank you for inviting me to be with you today, and again, my congratulations to you, Dr. Ham, and to you, Dr. Chung, for this splendid conference. Thank you. We will now take a 15-minute coffee break. Uh, the first plenary session, titled The New Normal, will begin in this room at 10.30. Thank you very much.